Hey guys, Rex here. We got a question in from Kevin on Patreon concerning long range shooting. If you guys have questions about any of that stuff or anything else, uh, you can sign up on Patreon. I will answer your question in a video form. Once in a while, maybe I'll share it on YouTube, um, but uh, primarily we answer stuff over there almost like you know every day, several times a week. So lots of videos of good questions on Patreon. Hi Rex. Hi Kevin. What's up, man? Thanks for all you do. You're welcome. Uh, where do I get a bullet drop info for humidity or air density altitude? Been gathering data for over a year and have been successfully consistent out to a thousand yards. This week, air density altitude was a full 1,000 foot lo lower than normal. Dry, cool fall day versus humid spring summer. And all of a sudden, my shots were low by at least uh, 0.5 mils. I want to move to calculations versus trying to manually adjust from standard conditions. Be blessed. Kevin, I'm using the Kestrel to capture environmentals. And as I said, this trip showed air density altitude to be 2,600 uh, when previous trips are closer to 3,600, 3,800. Well, Kevin, to answer your question real quickly, and then I'm going to give you my full thoughts on it. Um, yeah, you, density altitude is a very simple way to grab everything going on in the environment in terms of your air density and just give you like one number to dial off of, right? And you can just have different tables for air densities or you can run your ballistics real simply or whatever, you know, based on um, density altitude, right? Um, so basically, it's just summarizing everything, uh, converting it over. It's very popular amongst pilots. And it's popular amongst like uh, competitive shooters and even military guys who want to keep it simple as long as they have the tools to give them the air density altitude. To some people, that might be an intuitive calculation to know or to, you know, that's something people can feel after enough experience. Pilots would probably have that pounded into their heads so well, they, they would just know, okay, it's about this warm, I'm at this altitude, it feels like a storm's coming in. Uh, the air density should be around here, right? To a lot of people, that's not all that intuitive. People think in terms of, oh, it's about 70 degrees. Oh, it must be like 50 degrees today. Um, it feels really humid. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Humidity is a tiny, 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 tiny part. They can, you know, they can think in terms of barometric pressure. Okay, a storm's rolling in. The pressure must be dropping. How much does it drop? You're going to have to be somewhat of an environmental scientist or a meteorologist, a somewhat, um, to have a good intuitive idea of what the atmosphere is like intuitively. One of the, There's other reasons people break it up into individual environmental components. Um, one of them, like I said before, is, is if you, all your tools are gone, if your batteries go dead, if there's an EMP or whatever, right? If you don't have access to your special tools, you lose it, fell out of your pocket, stepped on it, whatever, right? If you don't have those special tools, it's still very intuitive, even to someone who's not a shooter, to be able to figure out what the temperature is. Just, okay, it's about this much. Or what what general area you're at, okay? I'm in this particular valley um, from, you know, looking at our maps or just being, you know, familiar with our area. Like, I know that this has got to be around 6,000 feet or whatever, right? Or like, oh, man, I'm, it's flat out here. It's totally 800 feet on this side of the state, right? So you can get close enough to make a good shot. So if you are asking for humidity, where do I get bullet drop data info for humidity or density altitude? Um, maybe we're conflating some terms. It's a little hard to decipher the exact question, I guess. Um, humidity... Is going to be factored in to some things like like if you just get if your Kestrel's telling you what your air density is, then it's taken into effect everything, right? If if you have it set up that way, there's different now. There's a whole variety and different generations from the old days working up to modern stuff, and God knows what they're going to come out with next week. But you can set up those Kestrels a lot of times a little uh, you know uh, bar barometer in there to like. You can turn it on, you can turn it off, you can turn features on, off, you can do wet bulb, you can, you know, and when you're reading your temperature, by the way, too, what's just as important as having the right tool is having the right methods to run that tool. If you just pull your Kestrel out of your pocket and click go, it's giving you wrong information. 
talk about that at Rex Defense classes. When we do RX ELR, right? When we do the ex extreme long range shooting, if you just pull your Kestrel out or lay it on the mat next to you, then pick it up and then read the numbers off there and it's reading the environmentals, it's going to be off. It's going to be way off sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, and I can tell by how you're managing the equipment, oh, maybe it'll give you the right number. Why? Thermal heating of the tool is, is placed in the sun, is placed on a black shooting mat versus a tan shooting mat or in the grass or in the shade, um, or you didn't actually use it as instructed. There are ways to make sure you get the proper temperature reading, right? Also, with everything else you might have, your barometric pressure set to station pressure uh, versus corrected, like depending on how your ballistics are set up, like that'll totally throw you off. Um, so you have to kind of know meteorology. Also, what I'm discerning here in, in humidity, by the way, if you're going to chart out individually, that's one of the cool things about not just having the computer summarize everything for you in one note. Oh, just here's the reading. Here's my dope, 27 mils. Or that's pretty far, right? Um, 27 mils, yeah, maybe, right? But you can't, you're not going to know if you miss why you missed because it's not showing you individual components. You can't double check that. Um, what I'm saying is like, if it is your temperature that's way off, right? And you have some of the Kestrels now have muzzle velocity variation uh, feature in there that'll read the air temperature and adjust your velocity, which is what happens with ammunition, I wonder why that happened over the years, <laughs> right? And awareness, there was, you know, a few years ago, there was a general increase in the awareness of muzzle velocity variation in civilian uh, long range uh, industry. And so they've they've caught up with that. They've made temperature stable powders, have helped not completely cured it, uh, but then also just keeping track of it's a big deal, right? But if you're not managing your tool properly, it's gonna, it could be way off. So it's a very, very difficult not knowing you, Kevin, I don't think, unless you've been to a class and I talked to you, and, and I'm not trying to be like, oh, we're so smart. Like, there is a lot going on when it comes to, because you're mixing atmospherics, which you have to have your tool set up right to measure those properly. A Kestrel just won't shoot it at you. You have to go into the guts, program it the exact way it needs to be, understand what the atmospheric different, you know, subcomponents are, and all this other stuff. And then you also need to understand all the different effects induced on the rifle in, internally with internal ballistic variations, ammunition temperature differences, bore axis shifts, all the stuff we talk about at the seminars and the RX-1000 and the RX-3000 class, right? And if you get all that squared away, you're hitting the beer can at a thousand yards. You're hitting the clay pigeons with your proper calculation first shot sometimes, right? Or very close. We do it all the time in classes, so it works but you have to be very careful of exactly which components are where. If you have it separated into different like components individually of the atmosphere versus the internal ballistic variations on the rifle that you're logging everything, something goofy happens, you can account for, okay, it was 0.5 mils off. Why? All oh, right here. Did we, that, yeah, we slopped through this part. I didn't set the deal up. I forgot to check for a headwind or what, or there's upslope here. There's so many different things that can have that happen. It's nice to divvy it up. So for problem shooting, for learning and for mastering your ballistic software, you don't want to just be, um, you know, a monkey running a, run, running a Kestrel. Um, if you want to continue to learn what happens over time when you spend a little more time thinking about what you're doing as you're doing it individually in, in break up the different effects into different components is you master, you become the Kestrel. And I'm telling you, you need to double check those things because it's only, I mean, the math is based on a model, number one, right? Those models are based on the exact methods and materials in which that was tested, like what rifle and bullet and exact, what's the misalignment in the bore, the alignment, like nobody knows. Sometimes they log that a lot. Most of the times they don't give you those details. Your individual equipment and methods and materials for running your equipment is going to be different than most models were set up for. That's why there's deviation. That's why when you put everything perfect on the inputs in your little computer and you shoot, the bullet lands in a different spot. Is it wrong? No, it's probably exactly right for the guy that invented that and used it in a very specific way. If you use it in the exact specific way because you paid very close attention to the instructions or discovered it through use in blood, sweat, and tears, 
then you might match that information. But usually, it's not the case. There's too many different variations in environment, in the weapon, and in you, and in how the system is managed to account for that. So when you divide all these different things, like when you have different sections in your ballistics, right? When you're adjusting off of those environmentals as individual components, <laughs> you'll notice things like when you have it graphed out the way that I've done it for years, um, where you have like a separate column under your graph for humidity, for your extremely detailed tables, just for education purposes, you'll notice you can't even dial for it most of the time. It's such a tiny, t from 0% humidity to 100% humidity in the environment by itself is almost, un it's, it's uh, practically insignificant until you get to extreme long ranges, like way farther than you're going to shoot. Artillery, yeah, they got to worry about that. These high Mars guys, the rocket guys, MRS guys, spaceships, like they got to worry about humidity. But for small arms fire, I mean, I'm talking at a thousand yards, you sort of press into a click. Like you don't give it a full click, you just press into it a little bit, right? Because it's very, very small. It's like 0 .00 whatever clicks for your humidity variation. Just like almost like what can happen and why they were confused in the old days and why they thought they were observing humidity changes was twofold, right? Number one, it seemed like the air was thicker or thinner because of being humid or whatever. They actually got that upside down in the field manuals. Um, I did a video on that like 10 years ago, right? On how the FM23 got it upside down. It actually has a reverse effect. They forget about uh, things like barometric pressure with weather, weather systems. When you have a humid weather system rolls in, you know, then you have different barometric pressure trends that uh, tend to come in with uh, moist weather, right? Like rain, or then like when they get a high pressure system, then you have a different kind of humidity, generally speaking, not all the time. So it was misattributed because they weren't individually chopping it up. They weren't scientific enough in the small arms aspect. Field artillery has always had that squared away. Um, you can read the FM 6-40 where they chop it up into different blocks. Their firing tables are very detailed and they actually understand all those individual components. You talk to a guy that does the calculations for artillery and they've known that for 100 years, right? Um, so uh, humidity, you don't really need to worry about humidity with small arms um, unless you come to an RX ELR class, then we dial it in because it, it is a little bit. But what is usually happening here, um, if you are varying um, your elevation by 0.5 mils, there are so many things that could have done that that are not humidity and are not related to air density altitude, right? Density uh, is like a way of measuring and consolidating all your atmospherics into something simple and quick. If you want to get more precise, that's fine. You just have to divvy up all the, the remainders of things that that doesn't account for. Um, like wind. If you have a tailwind or a headwind, that will affect your elevation. How much? Usually not half a mil, not at close range, like inside a thousand yards, usually. But if it's a strong wind, and you got terrain where it's actually having an up push, right? Or if the air drops off, depends on where you're at on the on the topography. It can have a decent effect. You can have a couple clicks. You can have, you know, a few tenths of a mil at a thousand yards sometimes. Depends on your bullet, everything like that. Um, aside from wind, muzzle velocity variation is a big deal. Um, let's say we got a target. Okay, I'm going to draw a target, guys. Ready for this? All right, let's say this is your target right here. Can you see that? And you aim here, okay? Let's say that your cone of fire for your rifle, your rifle shoots one minute of angle. Let's say this is 10 inches wide. So it's approximately that. That's your cone of fire, theoretically, okay? So your rifle at 100 yards consistently shoots at a minute of angle. At 1,000 yards, it's 10 inch wide or 11 inch wide target, approximately, right? And it's gonna be about like that, okay? Problem is, wind deflection, if you have left and right wind, is going to move you like this. And if you have wind quartering at you, now it's going to move you like this. If you have wind coming at you, a tailwind, it can move you like this, right? So this is upward and downward deviation beyond this center point here, right? So now you got to account for that potential deal. So you have to be doing a wind log if you're really going to get really fussy 
Practically speaking, in most field situations, hunting or tactical, if you shoot and you hit over here someplace or somewhere within these other deals, just adjust fire real quick. And if you miss again, well, then adjust fire real quick again. Um, so there's that that can throw off your deal. Let's get another deal. Muzzle velocity variation due to ammunition temperature. So as your rifle gets hot, as your rifle warms up in the sun, as your ammo gets cool and hot, you'll have an exacerbated vertical dispersion like this. Is there really that much, Rex? Yeah, it can be. Like if your ammo's uh, sitting in the sun and all of a sudden like the sun changes angle and you're in the shade, or you move your drag bag over and now it's shaded after about 10 minutes, yeah, it can change from here to here. You can miss here and then you can miss here easily. It can be a, it can be a big amount depending on what you're burning. Now for temperature stable powders, it's probably not that much, okay? Um, but this can absolutely happen. This is why dudes miss over the top that much. I mean, it's not this, but it's that. So that's one thing too. Humidity, man. Okay, let's say your humidity is like from 100% to 0%. Okay, that's going to change you from here to like have a little bit of a pressure. I mean, not even discernible. Basically, you're in the same spot. If you quantify it and mathematically figure it out for most situations, most projectiles, okay? Um, there's all kinds of other stuff going on. Um, as your rifle heats up and cools down in different uh, environmental conditions, it'll induce um, axis of the bore being shifted because your receiver and, and barrel are mated together with threads and how they interface as one heats up at a different rate than the other one, it will cause things to flex a tiny bit and then all of a sudden your recoil, you know, uh, lug might be touching in one spot or like the shoulder or where the thread engagement is, like those tiny variations can realign the barrel as temperature flexes. Not warping the barrel, but just within where it's threaded into the action or the stock or the chassis or the muzzle brake or the muzzle device or whatever you're using, man, can affect a lot. Your bore axis shifts is gonna make everything bigger. So all the stuff here, this is just your rifle changing with its internal ballistics, right? So what happens is, and you can look up a thing called WEZ, Weapons Employment known, uh, Zone Analysis. Weapons Employment Zone Analysis. I think Applied Ballistics has that. It'll basically, you can type in all your parameters and how fussy you want to be with like your standard deviation, your velocity of your ammo. How consistent is your velocity? So if you have good standard deviation in your ammo, you can shrink this vertical dispersion and compress it into a smaller area, which can help you tremendously. That can bump you up. Just not paying attention to your ammunition uh, temperature can move you this much. But having sloppy um, standard deviation, like if you got like a standard deviation of 25 feet a second, um, you're going to have this even more exacerbated, right? It's going to be worse. Plus all the horizontal effects that could be induced by the internal ballistic differences, right? Um, so basically that'll add more slop to there. So then like that's a problem. So this is a really good program. You can figure out like which deals need to be tightened up to give you a better hit probability. And it'll plot out like a million little, right? If you take 50 shots or 100 shots or whatever, where do the bullets land? It's actually very good software. It's like very accurate. Um, it's not the end all of anything, of course, because there's more going on than that. But um, it'll give you, and then it'll even have statistical flyers. It's all based on good math. Like they're, they're very good engineers at applied ballistics. Uh, so you can look up WEZ to learn more about what I'm talking about. And those are just some of the things. There's a number of other things, of course, what if it was something like the illumination of your reticle because the position of the sun changed? Well, you could hit way the hell over here. You could hit way the hell over here now um, because of the light coming into your optic differently. A lot of times guys miss by 0.5 mils, wherever that might be, right? Like over here someplace. And they're like, oh, it was the humidity. Like, wait a minute. It could have been a thousand different things, right? And understanding how those individual components are weighted in the overall ballistic calculation is very helpful for problem shooting so you're not chasing your tail all over the place, right? Which is what takes years to figure out in long range shooting. I mean, I screwed around with that for 20 years before I kind of got it all pinned down, right? We need to get really scientific. Let's chop everything up into individual components and start figuring it out, right? That's why we do the seminar. Huge part of it is how do you organize all this stuff just in your brain? Like how do you even like set up any kind of system to figure it out, right? So there's a lot going on. It's not just like hitting a Kestrel. Kestrel can help out a lot on the atmospherics, but there's a lot of stuff it can't do that you have to log. Like muzzle velocity variation, guys keep asking for the uh, logs 
that I used to do where he kind of calculates a curve for you. Hold on. This is what we do on Patreon all the time. We whiteboard stuff. I, I try to answer your questions in the most detailed fashion possible. Rux, why don't you do this? I'm doing it. I'm doing it on Patreon. Okay, um, so what the hell are we talking about? Oh, geez, look, now I ruined it. It's all ruined. Talking about the ballistics uh, deal there. Oh, the muzzle velocity variation, okay? So here's your chart. Low temperature, zero degrees, 50 degrees, 100 degrees. Whatever your low velocity is, your high velocity for your uh, your load. And like you can kind of graph it out like your velocity will be generally lower and climb as the ammo heats up, generally. And I developed a deal a long time ago and some other guys like improved on that where you can type in, what's your velocity at 60 degrees? 2750, okay, it'll hype. Uh, hypotheticalize where it should be over here based on other loads, based on their measuring equipment, based on that weapon and everything. This is not reality for you. This is a general trend line. This is ex this is really simply explaining what can happen in the universe with velocity variation. If you just plug this in and assume this line's correct, you're going to be way the hell off. There is no shortcut to actually logging it. How do you log it? Get yourself a sheet of paper <laughs> in your notebook. You, know, you can have your phone app and then you won't be able to use it when it's 40 below zero because you have to have your gloves on or when rain hits it, you won't be able to use it. Your battery goes out, you won't be able to use it. Or you can use a freaking write in the rain piece like notebook or whatever, right? Or a piece of paper, right? That you keep in your, your dope book, right? All right, gonna shoot a group here. Log on your X and Y axis, your velocity, right here so let's say this is whatever feet a second right so you get out your chronograph and you shoot at this temperature 60 degrees and you log okay what's the you read the number over here on your um um chronograph and then plot it where did the how fast were the bullets going at what temperature next day you go out oh man it's really cold oh what the hell i expected it to be way less velocity at a lower temperature because of rex's graph Rex's graph was trying to educate people, not give you the bone. Like, here's the golden rule for all guns for all space time. No, dude, it's not how that deal works. Um, how about here? Like, what the hell? At 50 degrees, it was this much. And you could make notations like, drank coffee, an extreme amount of coffee. And over here, you can say, um, sock was in the way of the whatever, or there's grass in the way of the thing. Like, or over here, like, bipod was not steady or, or let's say over here you get a group right okay that's good and then one day you shoot another group in the same conditions and it's over here what the hell same conditions here but the, it was different well what changed okay so if you log in science the more you log the better cleaner bore right like 100 rounds to the bore versus um what here Dirty bore, filthy, filthy bore, filthy bore right here, like 10,000 rounds to your bore, like, or whatever, right? I'm just giving you hypotheticals. Now you have way more information. Now you have a powerful tool. There ain't nothing that graphs this out as far as I know in terms of computers. If there is, someone should show me. And if it's easier to run than a damn piece of paper, I'll give you a Daniel Webster cigar, just a piece of paper and a pen. That's the tools you need right there. Log your velocity. So after time, the more observations you make with your chronograph, bring your chronograph in the field to, to make this chart awesome. You're gonna notice there are outliers and then there's general. So a lot of your data points will be kind of in here. You notice scatter plot is in science, right? So there's your scatter plot. It's all over the place. That's reality. It's gonna be all over the place. It's just how it is. So your scatter plot's gonna be like so. You draw a trend line through the middle. Oh, okay, now you have a trend line, right? Or let's say that's not even how it was. Let's say that there is more actually is here. Did you know that in real life, if you actually draw a trend line through the scatter graph or scatter plot, sometimes it looks like the stock market? Why? Why would it be like that? Internal ballistic variations that you can't imagine on a very microscopic level that cumulatively add up to constrict certain spots and certain different things and cause shit to be different, okay? Point is, you have to log this. 
because that'll throw you by half a mil easy. And you can't just do a straightforward, like you can't just draw a line, right? Now, once you have your trend line drawn, you can have your outside, you know, uh, parameters of that, like what's the, where the scatter plot would go, and then study what you're doing. Pay attention and write down what you're doing. Generally speaking, when I'm up here, my bore is dirty. When I'm down here, it's clean or vice versa. Or sometimes, I mean, I've seen them that were going the opposite way. That was higher here, perhaps because of constriction of certain parts in the bore, which caused more pressure to push the projectile. And then it like got slower at high temperatures. There's a lot of stuff happening. Well, I, I've never seen that in my blog, Rex. Log it. Empirical data is king. Empirical data is king. It is Rex. Em empirical data. Observed data. You have to observe what your thing does. So you have to do everything like that. Velocity, I mean... If you do a table like that, you can account for bore conditions. You can account for all the internal ballistic variations that happen. Basically, this is your uh, velocity variation uh, system for all things if you log more, right? You're not just logging the air temperature. You're also logging the bore conditions and your shooting position, what kind of coat you are. Uh, oh, I was wearing a fluffy winter coat this day, and it's a big magnum, and I was doing free recoil. That'll change your velocity. If you're holding it with a t-shirt on real tight, managing the recoil, totally, it'll get, it'll, it'll adjust your velocity, man. I think uh, Frank Galley talked about that before, like years ago. That actually happens. Like if you loosely hold a rifle versus tightly grip it, it'll change it. If you wear like a real poofy coat and then like muscle on it, like in the summer against your, you know, big muscles or whatever, it'll change your damn velocity. Point is you have to log these things, okay? So your 0.5 mil deal could also be that. Also, oh, being misaligned from the scope, having the sun change its position can not only change the illumination of the reticle in the scope, um, it can also act as a lens from thermal variation in the air coming at a different angle. There's different lighting effects in the atmosphere that'll change your perceived point of aim. And, you're, and you might have lensing in the atmosphere, right? So all those things will increase that that deal. So when you have, remember how we had all the different intersecting circles of different effects? That's just the way shooting is. That's why people miss, okay? The more you figure out what the hell's going on and the more you log, the more you can reduce that until you hit the beer can every time, right guys? Or a lot of the time, not every time, okay? You're going to have stuff adjusting here. You're going to have some of the stuff here. Some of it's going to look like this. Some of it's going to be skewed like this. Smiley face patterns you might have. I'm serious. Like there's all kinds of different effects that, and then like, okay, here's your wind. Um, here's your spin drift or whatever, like very, like there's a lot of stuff that's going to be intersecting over your target. What you need to do then, okay, see that? Now we're going to erase that, is you need to summarize that. You need to summarize the sum total of everything into one overall actual conifier, which might be this big instead of your theoretical, which was only this, well, oh, shit, like that big. Like your one minute cone of fire now actually at distance, at whatever distance it is, based on all the stuff might be bigger. Okay? So now when you shoot and you miss over here, oh man, I'm high and right by whatever mills and, you know, did you miss or were you holding perfect for your average and a shot went here because your cone of fire is different? And the next time you shoot, it's here. If you didn't, if you didn't change your hold, you keep your hold the exact same, right? What guys will do is they'll hit here, and then they'll assume, oh, I need to aim this low. Okay, so now you're holding here to account for this miss, assuming this is going to hit in this exact exact spot at the same time. Now it shits, shoots here. What the hell is my scope off? It should have hit exactly here. No. You forgot about the cone of fire and your dispersion of shots within that cone of fire. This was on the outer edge because statistically it's going to land somewhere in the circle, but you over adjusted because you didn't account for that. So when you're adjusting fire at longer ranges, there is a strategy you can employ, right? If you have larger cone of fires, so you want to hit here, right? And let's say you miss here. Well, if your cone of fire was like we showed before, and, and, and assume it could be like this, right? Or it could be like this, guys, right? 
you want to make smaller adjustments. So instead of moving way the hell down here to bring this in there, you want to cut this in half. There's different strategies that professionals will do, but you're going to want to bring this in, assuming, think in terms of that cone of fire. All right, I'm just going to ease it down a little bit because if I'm wrong, because statistically it'll somewhere be in the middle usually, but if I'm wrong and that was just an outlier on that side, I'm not going to way over adjust. So some guys will cut that in half, right? Assuming, okay, it's going to be on the shoulder if it does exactly what it did last time, but if it's somewhere in the middle here, then I'm still golden, right? Does that make sense? So think in terms of cone of fire and statistics when you're doing that. And guess what? You cannot draw a conclusion based on a couple of shots, especially at range. There's way too much going on that can disperse that. And so guys will adjust their ballistics, will adjust their coefficients, will adjust all their stuff. And then what happens is your these loose rings are you're chasing them all over the place. So it's imperative if you're a long range shooter, you want to be precise to reduce all those different effects and nail them down in an atomic form with each different environmental being separately accounted for. Sign it's more work at first, but after you figure it out. You actually get the right inputs then. Like I got the exact right BC because we eliminated the headwind, the tailwind out of it. We eliminated the shooter. We eliminated the different lighting effects. We eliminated weird ballistic internal effects. We accounted for muzzle velocity variation. We know that this bullet in these uh, conditions, which is now my field laboratory uh, con conditions, right? Which you could call your um, uh, designated standard conditions. We know like based on enough shots and enough elimination of all these things, that now my cone of fire is pretty, I mean, it's, you figured out all those different things. So now you can keep, instead of them overlapping and being linked together, you can keep them all sort of in the center. Now you have a lot more high probability of actually hitting what you're aiming at. When you develop a firing system with the proper numbers where you're not chasing your tail, is what I'm saying, okay? You still want to employ all those things. There's a lot going on. Um, or get a semi-auto and just fire one. And if it misses there, adjust down, over, fire. And if it hits, you know, and you over-adjusted and you need to send it, well, then just keep, I mean, you can make up for that with firepower too. That's why they invented machine guns, man. <laughs> you know, you want to be the world's slowest machine gunner and just kind of like, you know, semi-auto, you know, like a, get one of those six, five Creedmoor semi-autos, man, and get to work, right? Depends on exactly what you're doing too. Not every target's going to stand around still for you and not change its position or distance or duck, just waiting, watching bullets zing past it. But depends on the situation. There's context to everything. Hopefully that sort of explains it. Yeah, um, most, to answer your question again, just to recap, most modern ballistic programs will have density altitude um, mixed in there. It'll be an option to do it, to set up your tables that way. Um, or, you know, the humidity will be accounted for in a lot of them, um, especially if you're running a Kestrel, right, that has all the environmentals in it. The ones that are hooked up to phone lines, man, like, yeah, depends on where you're at. I'm never where the phone works. And there's, like, not a laboratory around here that would give me the proper environmentals for my area. So I don't like the phone-based ones just because they're not where I'm at. And the environment changes so much. Um, you know, when you're 100 miles from the airport... You know, it's picking up the temperature at the airport, not in my yard or whatever, right? So that's something to consider too. But so, yeah, they have they have stuff that's doing what you're asking for, but what you're asking for might not be what's going on. There's a lot more going on. Log, everything. Go through the Sniper 101, right? Um, those are all moving over to Patreon, guys. If you want to catch those, they're going to be all on Patreon pretty soon. I'm uploading one per week over there. I got a bunch of them over there already. And then once they're all over there, I might just uh, to salvage... The other channel, as we get more stupid with our politics, I'm going to get rid of them um, on, on the public channel. But um, study the Sniper 101 stuff while it's there or come to Patreon. We can show you how to do that stuff. Um, basically, the system, the, the, the logic of the system hasn't really changed, right? How you log stuff. Um, just like anything else, right? When you're measuring or doing carpentry or like doing mechanics, there's a lot of individual things that can change, and cumulatively, it's tolerance stacking. So eliminate the tolerance, 
Make darn sure you're actually missing by five mils because of a known deal. Don't assume it's one deal or the other. Don't assume it's humidity because I can assure you it's probably not humidity. It's velocity variation or it's an internal ballistic deal or it's a firing position issue, maybe a bipod, maybe tension on the rifle, maybe cheek pressure, uh, maybe buttstock pressure. I mean, there's a variety of things. Cheek pressure will typically move you to the side, but um, there's a variety of other things is what I'm trying to say of other things that will throw you off that much or more that have nothing to do with what you're specifically asking for. So there you go, man. That's my answer. If you enjoyed this and you are watching on YouTube, come join us on Patreon and ask a question. I will answer it. <laughs> Hopefully you guys have a good one. You guys take care. Bless you. Rex out.